All right. I, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the Lab School of Washington for inviting me here to talk today. I really do always love to get out of my academic talk settings and uh, talk to actual parents and, and educators and people who are on the, the, on the ground implementing some of the things that we're trying to accomplish uh, from a research perspective. Um, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as was noted, um, there is much less research on math and in particular mathematics learning disabilities uh, than, as compared to reading. Um, you know, uh, uh, we are, there was really no such thing as, as a, a math learning disability um, up until even as late as the, the 90s before um, people started to recognize that as a, as a, a clinical um, issue and uh, you know so they're they're a good 25 years be behind reading so um, uh, you know while I said that we're, we're making some inroads there but um, at the same time we're still trying to figure out a lot of the very basic stuff about mathematical cognition and how it occurs in all populations in general so um, you know while I'm, I'm definitely uh, open to, to questions at the end or, or whatever about math learning disabilities a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is not necessarily geared specifically toward children um, with mathematics learning disability, although I do think that it would be broadly applicable to, to many such students. It's just that we haven't had time to do the research to test any of these ideas out in a variety of populations. And I'm sure that that's something we'll, we'll do in the future. Um, we barely agree on what math learning disabilities are right now still. So, um, you know, we have a ways to go before we get to where people are with reading. So I just wanted to preface my, my talk by, by saying that. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, spatial cognition. And this is an area where people over, the, especially the last five to 10 years or so, have, have started to look really closely at how spatial abilities and mathematics abilities uh, uh, work together with one another, where they overlap, where they're different, um, and then further the potential for uh, interventions that target um, spatial abilities to uh, improve uh, math abilities. Um, again, this is a very new area of research, so there's not a ton of definitive work in this area, um, but I just want to kind of give you a lay of the land of where this research has been um, over maybe like the last 10 years or so. So um, uh, here we go. So uh, uh, there has been a lot of research. A lot of it for a very long time was piecemeal. People would find some measure of spatial ability and they'd um, link it up to some other measure of mathematics ability. Like you'd see people um, you know, link up uh, uh, visual working memory to this or that ability to do arithmetic. I'm going to do it on this slide. I'm going to do it on this slide right here. Okay, so um, it's it's kind of an an, um, an ill-defined concept, and uh, part of uh, uh, the, the research that I've been doing now with Dr. Kelly Mix, who's at the University of Maryland, um, uh, she's been in, in this field a, a, a long time, and uh, what she started to do a few years ago is say, well, to what extent are mathematics abilities and spatial abilities separate? To, you know, how can we define spatial abilities in terms of a set of spatial tasks? How can we define mathematical abilities in terms of a set of spatial tasks? So uh, what, what she did was she took a whole bunch of mathematics measures. You can see here uh, mathematics measures were related to place value, uh, word problems, calculation, uh, missing terms. Missing terms is sort of a pre-algebra kind of uh, uh, topic. Um, number line estimation. Uh, when kids get a little older, we included fractions, uh, and then charts and graphs uh, as kids got older as well. Um, and then uh, in this study, uh, there was also uh, a set of purportedly spatial measures. Uh, mental rotation, uh, visual spatial working memory. I'm going to describe what all of these tasks are as we, as we go further. Uh, visual motor integration. Uh, visual motor integration is uh, uh, essentially just the ability to, one of the good ways they measure it is by having people copy a figure by drawing. Um, uh, uh, block design, that's the ability to build blocks that have a certain uh, uh, target structure. Uh, map reading and perspective taking. Uh, and what perspective taking refers to is kind of your ability to look at a spatial scene and envision what someone else who's looking at that scene from a, a different perspective would see, OK? Um, now, uh, it turned out that when, uh, when we performed a factor analysis uh, in order to, uh, that's, that's how we try to discriminate where the mathematics measures are and where the spatial measures are. And uh, I, I'm not going to get into any of the details of what that is. The simple way to think about it is a factor analysis says, um, tries to figure out which, which measures like to hang out together. All right. Um, so if all of the mathematics measures hang out on, an, on one factor, 
so to speak. And all of the spatial measures hang out on another factor that shows that um, uh, spatial abilities and math abilities as in a domain, in a general sense, as we refer to them, are, are separate. Um, now, that doesn't preclude them at the same time from being correlated. And that's, in fact, what uh, uh, Dr. Mix and colleagues have found. They found that mathematics ability and spatial ability are very clearly separate from one another. There was a clear spatial factor um, that captured variation in all of the spatial measures, and a clear mathematics factor that captured all of the variation among the, uh, 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 the mathematics measures. Um, so, uh, however, at the same time, those two factors, those two overall factor scores, were correlated very, very strongly. Uh, if you know about correlations, their correlation between the factors was 0.5 to 0.6, which is really very high for any two psychological variables. So, it's a, it's a really interesting result. And you know, we find that they're not the same thing, um, but at the same time, they have something in common that drives them to be pretty highly correlated. And uh, the question that we're trying to sort out now in, in follow-up research is, what might cause spatial ability and math ability to be correlated if, in fact, they are really separate things, which they pretty clearly seem to be? Um, OK. So one way we can try to sort this out is by uh, uh, looking at a, a bunch of different specific relationships that have occurred previously in literature, and then trying to make sense of a more general analysis of the sort that Dr. Mix um, did. So what I'm going to list here are uh, spatial abilities and mathematics abilities. And these are just a subset of what I, I listed on the first screen. These are our um, uh, uh, basically uh, spatial measures and mathematics measures that I think are uh, particularly relevant uh, uh, not only to um, uh, possibility of intervention, they, these might be spatial abilities that you could improve over time, and that might somehow transfer to mathematics. But um, uh, knowing that a big part of the mission of uh, the lab school here uh, involves arts integration, I think that these are some spatial abilities in particular that uh, play into a lot of different artistic activities that, that kids are commonly engaged in. And one of my goals, uh, and we'll talk about this at the end, is to try to help you, help you folks see um, how some of these spatial abilities might be integrated better and more clearly and more strongly into artistic activities in an effort to improve them over time and potentially uh, provide an, uh, something of an alternate route uh, through which people might be able to improve kids' mathematics skills. Um, now, I will preface this by saying that I am a total enemy of anything that remotely resembles uh, an educational magic bullet. Um, I am not going to tell you that I think that the, the secret to kids learning mathematics is going to be training them in spatial abilities. I think that would be preposterous. Um, I think anybody who says that there's one thing that you're going to do that's going to improve mathematics, no matter how many books that sells or whatever, um, uh, is, is probably uh, uh, going in the wrong direction. But anyway, so here's the spatial abilities I'm going to talk about. Um, one of them is, is block design, and, and that is what it sounds like. It's literally taking blocks and constructing them together to form uh, some sort of larger uh, structure. Uh, the second one is visual spatial working memory. Um, I'll show you an example of all of these in a second. Visual spatial working memory is sort of just your ability to look at a visual scene and remember um, where things are and what they are within that scene. And then the last one that turns out to be very, very important is mental rotation. Um, and mental rotation is essentially your ability to uh, look at a figure and then recognize what would happen to that figure if you rotated it in space. Okay? It can refer to 2D figures or 3D figures. Um, but uh, it, it turns out that that's a very central spatial ability. And the math measures we're going to look at, and, and the math measures we're focusing on here are things that um, uh, some of them have a clear sort of spatial element to them. One of the first things people think of when they think of um, spatial abilities in math is number lines, right? Because you have this, this linear representation of quantity um, that has a, 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 you know, a spatial basis. Um, so people think about number lines a lot. But it turns out there are lots of other things, and we're going to see more of them throughout the talk, that uh, uh, don't seem like they would have a lot to do with spatial ability. But when you dig a little bit deeper, it really turns out that they do. Um, some of those things are just simple magnitude comparison, which number is bigger. Uh, things like place value, um, which we're studying right now at the University of Maryland. We have an ongoing study uh, uh, funded by the NSF to examine place value learning. Um, and then lastly, fractions. So these are the math topics that I'm going to talk about today. I focus especially on place value and even more so on fractions, because fractions, especially in uh, the late elementary uh, years, is a tremendously strong gatekeeper. 
Um, uh, and it's something that, you know, some children struggle with for years to get past. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say, like I said, I'm not going to I'm not going to suggest that I can fix fractions uh, overnight with any of the things that I'm going to say. But I do think there are some inroads that could be made. Um, now, the question that we're going to have is what is in this red thing in the middle? What makes those spatial abilities be related to these other mathematical abilities? Uh, so that's what we're going to go through now. Um, first, I want to describe in a little bit more detail what these, how we, how we measure these different spatial abilities. So let's look at um, uh, uh, block design or, uh, uh, or, or free play with blocks. Now, this might seem a little bit strange, but there are actually um, theorists who've come up with uh, uh, scales for trying to figure out how advanced a child's block play is. I know that sounds almost too scientific. Um, you know, you don't want to project that too much on a child. But if I can explain this a little bit more clearly, um, what that means is, is, is someone is, is engaging in slightly more advanced uh, uh, block play. If instead of just arranging blocks in, in relatively random ways or making, um, you know, structures without regard for which block has which shape, or um, which block uh, goes where, or what color they are, or all of these things, um, then, then you would think of that as being a somewhat less advanced form of block play. Um, however, when you do something like this on the right, like make a rocket, all right, in order to build this rocket, you have to take into account the properties of the blocks themselves in order to make it adequately represent a rocket that someone else could recognize. So if a kid does this with their blocks, we think of that as a much more advanced form of block play. Okay, now um, th this is an interesting longitudinal study by the the, the fellow Wolfgang. Yeah, I, I have citations on a lot of these. Um, at the end of the the, the talk, I'm going to give you an email address, and if you actually want any of these citations, I'm, I'm happy to provide a bibliography. Um, but uh, what this this study showed that was that in a in a longitudinal study, preschoolers uh, who exhibited more advanced block play performed better in math later in school. And when I say later in school, I'm not kidding. They tracked these kids all the way to high school. And some of these effects didn't emerge until much later in time. Um, now, the, uh, the other uh, area of research that people have done involves um, some, something more like a, a testing of block design. And that, that has to do with something like this. Like if you see this task, now um, on the top here, there is a design. And what the student's task in, in, in this is, um, is uh, to reconstruct that figure using a, a set of blocks, okay? Um, this, this is actually a picture of a, a the block design is a subtest of a, a well-known standardized test. Um, yeah, uh, Wexler's Intelligence Scale for Children. Um, but that has a, a block design uh, subtest to it. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, as does the Woodcock-Johnson, I believe, but anyway. Um, there's been a considerable amount of research that's linked scores on these block design subtests to overall mathematical abilities as well. All right. Now, the next topic that I want to talk about, the next spatial ability, this is how we might measure something uh, uh, that we, what we call spa visual spatial working memory. So you can see on the screen here, you've got an array. Um, what this is is a nine by nine array, and a child would see a set of objects that are uh, displayed on that array in, in some arrangement. Um, they're showed this um, very quickly, um, you know, usually on the order of like that, like maybe a half second. And then their job is to mark the boxes where the objects were. Okay, so um, hopefully they uh, marked the locations of the boxes as that. The way these tests go, typically they get harder and harder until kids can't do them anymore. Uh, I chose a, this is a relatively easy example, although they do get easier as well. Um, so uh, that's visual spatial working memory. Visual spatial working memory has, just like block design, been linked to general math achievement. Um, and uh, there's some folks who've uh, offered some more specific hypotheses for why that might be. Um, visual spatial working memory might be important for dealing with relationships between numbers and quantities. So if you look at these two examples I've got on the screen, if you look on the left, um, uh, I want you to think about the, the process of uh, composing and decomposing numbers. So, if you want to be able to sort of see in your mind's eye, right, or see in a collection of five objects on, uh, uh, on just on a surface or something like that, that, oh, that, that group of five is made up of a group of three and a group of two, you have to sort of be able to hold in, in your mind's eye um, uh, what all these quantities are. You have to be able to see three, two, and together the fact that they form five. Um, uh, it, it, this also holds for differences between numbers. If you want to know what the difference is between three and five, you have to be able to hold three, 
and five in your head and recognize that if you added two more, the groups would be equal. Um, so these are the kinds of tasks that include visual spatial, uh, that involve visual spatial working memory. Another one uh, is a multi-step calculation, which is a big deal in around third grade, um, third grade and fourth grade, right? Um, and one of the, the, the processes that, that visual spatial working memory is hypothesized to be important for is, is stuff like regrouping, um, or for us old folks who learned it as borrowing and carrying, that's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I, 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 I have to, I, they made me swear an oath to call it regrouping now. Um, uh, but uh, as you can see, you know, in, in order to, to do this process, you need to be able to remember where the locations of those numbers are, and you need to be able to remember where to regroup or carry that one over. Um, and if you're having a hard time visually keeping track of all of the different elements in that visual array, it's going to make regrouping pretty difficult. Um, so uh, these are just some examples of how visual spatial working memory might uh, uh, affect mathematics. Um, now the last one, and this is one that we're gonna, we're, I'm going to focus on a lot, is, is mental rotation. Um, this is one that we actually use in our lab at uh, the University of Maryland. Um, this figure like the one at the top is actually what they do is they decompose letters and they cut them into pieces and then they just sort of recombine them in weird ways um, so that they make these strange things that vaguely look like letter forms but aren't letters, all right? So here's how this task that we do works. Um, if you, you look at that figure at the top, and then we give you four figures on the bottom, all right? Now I'm going to give you a, a second or two to look at this. And the question here is which two, and exactly two, are um, simply rotations of the figure at the top, all right? So I'm just going to let you stop for a second and think about how you might do that in your head, just let you do it, OK? All right. Now, one thing that, that, that people do, um, uh, that people who are good at mental rotation do that we're going to see in a minute, is they literally rotate these things in their mind's eye. They do this. They turn it and they match, and they turn it and they match. And then they look to see whether those two match the, tar the, 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 the stimulus. And as soon as they find two that match, they go, oh, I'm done. And then they don't even look at the other ones. Um, so this is what very, people who are very successful um, at mental rotation do. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the only way to solve the problem. Um, sometimes uh, uh, people don't come into mental rotation with, even with that strategy in mind. Um, so uh, uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, I should go back. This strategy that I just described where you mentally rotate the object in your mind's eye is often referred to as a holistic strategy, um, simply because you're kind of taking the whole object and rotating it. You're not breaking it down into um, smaller parts, or uh, another way to think of it is that you're taking all of the small parts and you're combining them into a single element and then rotating that. Now, another way you could do it, though, is like this. Everybody see that little hook on the top? You see that little hook? It hooks to the right. Now you find the other two that have that little hook that goes to the right, um, and then you know uh, you've got the two that match. Now, it turns out this is harder. Um, and it's more error prone also. So people, when they use this strategy, it takes them longer. Um, and they're also more likely to make a mistake. And you also see a lot more behavior because the people are generally less sure of their answers. They'll oftentimes check all of the answers um, in, in order to make sure that they've got the right two. Um, and I'll, I'll add one, one more possibility to this. I, I um, wanted to see, my wife is a, is a high school math teacher. I gave her this task. I wanted her to describe to me what her mental processes are. And uh, she, and I was like, oh, did you rotate them in your mind's eye? And then uh, did you do the other one? She said, I did both. Um, and, um, and I was like, did you exhaustively search all of them? I was, and she's like, yes. And uh, now, that's not to say that kids are doing that or should do that. Um, but if you really want to be a diehard, it's not necessarily the case that you have to stick to one strategy or another. If you really want to be extra sure in the way that high school math teachers do, um, you can combine these strategies, and they aren't clearly dis uh, discriminable sometimes. All right. Now, um, this strategy, I'm going to refer to it as an analytical strategy, mostly because that's what people in the literature have called it. Um, uh, some people have argued with this distinction, um, in, and, and they've just sort of, like, one, one thing that happens with analytical strategies is, is they might just be very, very specialized to that particular task. Um, they might not even fit well with the idea that your um, analytical brings to mind the, the process of breaking things down into elements. Um, and then solving the problem by examining the elements. And we're doing something sort of like that here, but people quibble with that. But just for the, the, the sake of this talk, I'm going to refer to these strategies that aren't holistic strategies as analytical strategies. Some people say that's just a catch-all category, and I'm, I'm actually fine with that conclusion uh, as well. Um, all right. 
So um, people who use a holistic mental uh, rotation strategy tend to perform better on mental rotation tasks. And the other thing about mental rotation is mental rotation, even compared to the other abilities I talked about before, has been linked most strongly to mathematical ability. Um, and also to, you know, this is to general mathematics achievement. There's also been the most research on mental rotation. So it's been linked to the widest variety of other mathematics measures. Um, it's also where we see some of the biggest effects of, of spatial ability. Um, uh, the, the differences between people and mental rotation are large, and, and the corresponding differences in mathematics ability um, tend to be large as well. Math, uh, mental rotation tends to be more strongly correlated with mathematics ability than some of these other spatial measures. Um, now, what I want to say is the kind of holistic strategy that we just applied uh, to this mental rotation problem, though, could also be applied to some of these uh, uh, other types of um, problems. Like if we look at this uh, uh, block design right here, right? Um, now, uh, if you are a person who is looking at this and you say, uh, or, or you're a kid who's building this, and you say, look, um, the, the, the rectangular and, and triangular blocks, when they're arranged in this particular way, they make a rocket, all right? That's a good example of having a holistic representation of a spatial problem, right? You see the parts at, for what they are. You can spatially represent all of the parts and their arrangement, but yet view them as a coherent whole. That's going to be a theme we're going to return to. Now, you kind of have the same thing in um, visual spatial work memory tasks. Uh, one way that you could solve this problem, if you wanted to remember the locations of the objects, is you could base it on what we would term internal relations. And that would be something like saying, like, oh, OK, um, the drum was to the right of the fish, and the birthday cake, I believe that is, is under the fish, and the cup of coffee is under the birthday cake, all right? So that would be a way to remember the problems on the basis of internal relations. Now, if you wanted to solve the problem through a more holistic process, though, what you might do is something like this. You might say, OK, the locations of these objects form an upside down L, all right? And if you can do that, that's going to make it easier for you to solve these visual spatial working memory tasks. So some of what I'm going to be talking about is, is um, the, the, the likely superiority for some of these holistic strategies for solving uh, 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 spatial tasks. Now, uh, this is a, is a little bit newer. And this is some research that we're working on right now at the University of Maryland. We think that a lot of this distinction about uh, holistic strategies can also apply to um, uh, mathematics problems. And we think that the fact that this holistic strategy might generalize, uh, this use of holistic strategies might generalize across spatial tasks and math tasks might be the source of the correlation between spatial ability and math ability. Um, so, you know, if you can, you, if you're really good at using holistic strategies and you use them consistently on spatial tasks and math tasks, that could be theoretically a source of the fact that, uh, excuse me, mathematics abilities and spatial abilities are so highly correlated. Um, so I'm going to go through just a, a little bit of what this might mean. Um, uh, the, the, the key thing to think about, if you, I know that it's a, it's a kind of a vague concept what a holistic strategy is. Holistic strategies require the combination of multiple spatial representations, be they different blocks, be they the locations of different individual objects in a visual spatial array. Um, so you, you have representations of the individual objects, but at the same time, you combine them into a coherent whole. Okay? Now, mental rotation epitomizes this ability, but um, as we saw with those spatial tasks earlier, holistic strategies can also help with uh, spatial and mathematics tasks. All right? What I want you to do is, is, is look at this right here. This is a common number line estimation task that we give a lot of kids. So we give them a number line like this right here. This is going from 0 to 100. And then we give them a number like 37, all right? And we say, all right, where, where do you think 37 goes on that number line, all right? Now, I'll give you a chance to think about it and think about how you're doing it while you're doing the problem. And eventually, we, you, know, you kind of arrive at something right around here. Um, now, I just eyeballed this, so I hope it's close. <laughs> um, I think that's about where 37 is. Um, now, uh, in order to put 37 in precisely the right place, though, you have to simultaneously represent um, multiple uh, uh, pieces of spatial information, right? Um, you need to be able to think about where the endpoints are and then also think about where this number, this target that you're trying to locate, would go between the endpoints given that it has a certain magnitude. Um, so again, we have this same sort of theme of there are, are, are different spatial representations and we have to combine them into a coherent whole in order to solve the problem. All right. Uh, here's another uh, uh, kind of problem that we might do. This is uh, a magnitude comparison problem. Now, this is, is, is uh, uh, pretty simple. Which is bigger, 7 or 3? 
Now, a lot of people, this is very simple to us, all right? But if you're five, it's not nearly as simple as you might think it is. Um, oftentimes, some kids, when they're first learning to do this, have to solve it by literally counting up through the sequence and then trying to remember which one temporarily came before or after the other one, all right? Now, um, as kids get a little bit more advanced, though, uh, what they end up doing is solving it in a slightly different way. And, and this is the way that adults solve it. Um, uh, basically, they think about where those, the distance between those two numbers, where they would be on the number line relative to one another. And one way we know that both children and adults do this is that the uh, uh, amount of time that it takes you to answer this question, which is bigger, seven or three, is a function of the difference between the numbers or their distance. It's called the distance effect, all right? When uh, we have a pair of numbers like seven or three, um, that would be easier for us to discriminate from one another and would take us less time to solve than if someone tells you which is bigger, four or five, all right? Um, so you know, this, is, this is a very strong piece of evidence that wh what we have are magnitude representations of these numbers, and these are magnitudes that we can think about. And, and even if we're not completely conscious of the, the, the fact that that's the way we're doing it, we have tons of evidence that that is, in fact, the way we're doing it. We're thinking about these numbers in relation to one another along some sort of spatial dimension, all right? Um, Here's another topic that, that, that we're really interested in right now, uh, uh, place value. Now, if I ask you a question like this, which number has a three in the hundreds place? And I give you these three numbers, all right? Um, now, again, we know all the shortcuts for this. Uh, we know that where the hundreds place is relative to the thousands place. But if you think about this, if you're just learning, right, and you're at the, while you're solving this problem, you're trying to remember, okay, well, you know, first we have the ones, and then we have the tens, and then we have the hundreds. Okay, I see that this one um, has a three here, but it, that, okay, that's in the thousands place. You have to, it, you know, um, solve this problem through a much more uh, methodical process than you do by just using the kind of shortcut that we have available once we've mastered the concept of place value. Um, but uh, what I want to point out is that this very basic process that you're engaging in, when you're just learning this, is critical to you ever reaching that stage where it becomes automatic. Um, if you can't work your way through this stage where you can sort out the spatial relations, which number is where in this array of numbers, and then be able to keep in mind which number is which, right? in this um, spatial array, you're going to have a hard time doing this. And you know, even if you can do it, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, all right? You know, now, uh, other, other things, I don't have ex examples of them, them here, but other things that, that uh, are important with spatial representations in place value uh, are um, things like uh, counting processes, right? Um, another task that we give kids a lot is called a base 10 counting task. And if you guys have ever seen base 10 blocks, I'm gonna show you some of these, and a picture of some in a little bit, but they have ones, and then they have the 10 bars, and then they have the 100 squares, all right? So we sometimes show kids pictures of those, and basically we look to see whether um, they count all the little squares one by one, or whether they actually recognize that there are 10 in one bar, and then once they see that, count by tens. Um, and you know, it's fun to do this. We've been doing a lot of research lately with kids in kindergarten, and there's huge variation. I mean, there are, there are kids, and I, I love it when they're this persistent and they believe that they're gonna get there. I just, but some kids will look at an array that's a, you know, three ones, five tens, and a couple of hundreds, and they'll start counting one by one. Um, you know, and after a little while, we have to be like, okay, that's, that's pretty good, um, you know, but we're gonna have to move along to the next one. So uh, the main thing that I wanna point out with this is a lot of these things that are, seem very trivial to us, all right? are not at all trivial to kids who are five, six, seven, eight years old, all right? Um, all right, one more topic that, that, uh, that I'm gonna talk about is uh, uh, fractions. So this is uh, uh, the kind of problem that's similar to, to, to the magnitude comparison uh, tasks that we had before, but it's a lot harder. Um, and tasks like this are hard for a, a good proportion of kids all the way up into sixth grade. Um, uh, and there are some, there are a large number of adults who swear they never learned fractions, even to this day. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, those who aren't, those who aren't loath to admit it, um, if you are one of those people, you are not alone. There are tons of adults who do not understand fractions very well. Um, and that's why I think it's a really important topic because it does have this, this very strong gatekeeper function for later mathematics. So if we look at these, we can see that the correct answer here is six ninths. Now, uh, the way that a sneaky adult might do it, if you've really mastered fractions, you might say something like, oh, well, the numerator six is smaller than the numerator seven, and the denominator nine is uh, uh, smaller um, than the number 11. 
um, uh, they're closer together. So that's how I'm, you know, you might be able to do it through some numerical trick, but, uh, or you might be able to reduce the fractions. You might say, okay, well, six ninths is two thirds and um, seven elevenths is something that's like a little bit closer to one. So uh, which one is it? Um, I don't know, all right? So um, these problems can be very difficult for kids to solve. Now, uh, in order to solve these problems, lots, what you have to do, and this is the very difficult thing, is you have to form a um, specific magnitude representation of the number and then compare them holistically. So you have to simultaneously remember that uh, uh, the numerator uh, over the denominator um, uh, it makes a whole magnitude value. And then you also have to recognize that uh, um, the, that the denominator is inversely related to the overall size of the fraction. So as um, the denominator gets bigger, the value of the fraction actually gets smaller. And in some of the previous research I've done on fractions, what we find is when kids are just learning fractions, they start out thinking that bigger numbers just means bigger fractions. So you can give them, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, they'll think that 50 over 100 is bigger than one half, for instance. Um, they'll just look for bigger numbers, because that's what they're used to. They're used to bigger numbers making bigger stuff, all right? Um, but, you know, so getting over this hump of actually understanding that, uh, the, um, uh, that there's a, a, an inverse relationship between the magnitude of the denominator and the overall value of the fraction is, is sort of a, a breakthrough moment for a lot of kids. And if kids can make that breakthrough, they usually end up being very good at fractions. Um, but in order to do that, they have to be able to spatially represent these things. You gotta say, okay, here's the thing on the top. As that gets bigger, the fraction gets bigger. Here's the thing on the bottom. As that gets bigger, the fraction gets smaller. Let me try and weigh these values against one another and come up with a magnitude representation for the value of that fraction. Um, so uh, in these problems that, that we've gone through thus far, uh, uh, things like place value, things like just magnitude comparisons, number line stuff, fractions, what I want you to see is that even stuff that doesn't seem to be inherently spatial has a lot of spatial cognition involved with it, a lot. Um, when people are first learning a given mathematics topic, they have to keep track of whether multiple numbers are on the left, the right, the top, the bottom, in between. Um, if when they're learning computation, um, you can make kids worth, worse at addition by spacing the uh, add ends and, and the symbol differently. You know, if you place if you place the uh, the the, uh, the numbers way far apart, or you put the equal sign in a slightly different place, even if the sentence reads the same way all the way across, you can impair someone's uh, arithmetic um, competence. Um, uh, not that we're trying to do that, but uh, for the purposes of an experiment, we found that, yeah, that can make people um, uh, uh, worse at arithmetic. So all of these things that don't seem to have a ton of a, a, a really strong spatial element to them actually, in fact, do. And um, I think that this is another thing that helps explain uh, what, what might be a kind of confusing relationship between overall spatial ability and overall math ability that's been observed previously. Now, um, one last caveat here. One thing that we're finding in our research that we found in um, the factor analysis studies that were done by Dr. Mix and colleagues is that spatial ability seems to be especially helpful when you're learning new math content, but over time, it tends to become less important. As you've mastered something, it turns out that your spatial ability is a lot less predictive of what your performance is gonna be. Um, so spatial ability is this thing that's really, really important when you're very young at learning some of these very simple um, uh, uh, arithmetic topics and, and, and fractions and things like that. When you get older, when you get into high school, um, you know, you start to learn about more complex geometric representations. You start to learn about calculus. You start to learn about um, uh, algebra. Um, all of these things at that point are going to start recruiting spatial abilities for those older kids. So this isn't a totally verified hypothesis, but we, we have a pretty, pretty strong hunch that this is the way that it goes with spatial ability. And it also helps explain why some of the results in the literature are so inconsistent. Um, if you take kids uh, with uh, different ages and um, you, know, you give them the same task, you might see that spatial ability matters for some and, and spatial ab ability doesn't matter for others, but it really is largely a function perhaps of the, the, the degree of mastery that that child has attained with the subject. Um, okay, so uh, a few other things. Does, this, is, this is one of the big questions um, that's out there in literature right now, and unfortunately there's not a ton of research. Does training spatial ability help with math, all right? Um, you know, there's, like I said, there's, there's a cottage industry out there of people 
who want to find magic bullets. They want to find some new way of teaching math that's going to make teaching math easy and is going to make everybody learn math great. You know, um, so like I said, I'm, I don't. I want to separate what I'm suggesting here from that. I think there are probably lots of ways that you, that you can um, uh, improve math instruction, and I just want you to, to think about this as one of them. Um, there's not a whole lot of research showing that training spatial abilities improves math achievement, but the initial results are pretty promising. Um, and what people have mostly focused on is mental rotation training. This is kind of just a, 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 a function of where the research is. We kind of go where the big effects are. All right, we know that mental rotation has kind of the strongest relation to math ability among different spatial um, ab abilities. Um, and it also has the most research out there. So we know a lot about how people do mental rotation. And we know a lot about how mental rotation ability develops over time. Um, now, uh, this, is a, this is sort of a high level example of, of a mental rotation exercise, all right? So um, this is actually a, a study, this is one of the first studies that was done. It was done among college students by a, a college professor who had uh, uh, students who were in STEM courses, all right? So if you look at this figure on the left, what this, um, in this study, what they had them do is they had them look at this figure on the left in black, and then they had them say, okay, I want you to rotate it 90 degrees ar about this axis. And then I want you to draw me a picture of what that would look like. So the correct answer here would be what's drawn in red. Okay. Now I'm, this isn't something that would be expected to be to do quickly. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly presenting it here because this is just kind of the first piece of evidence that came along that this kind of training might help. Um, but if you practice doing this a lot, there were some pretty remarkable effects among students in STEM courses at the university level. The students who engaged in, in a, a relatively um, robust process of this kind of mental rotation training um, had better grades in their STEM courses relative to the peers in a controlled experiment um, uh, uh, in, in the very courses. And in addition, they actually found that those people who uh, engaged in this form of mental rotation training tended to stay in STEM majors longer. Um, which I think is just a really remarkable finding, um, that you could have this one intervention in one STEM course, be it, albeit a, a pretty intensive one, but that it would have downstream effects that would, that would carry on throughout an individual's college career. Um, now, uh, we've also applied this to younger children. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Kelly Mix uh, and uh, some other colleagues uh, uh, gave six to eight-year-old children uh, mental rotation training uh, that's, that's a little bit more like this. And you can see how this might be more appropriate for a six to eight-year-old. Um, the question on the left is, which choice at the top, now I'm referring to the, the choices in the box, shows a shape that you could get by combining the two pieces at the bottom. All right, so you see these two pieces. Now, in order to figure out which piece at the top uh, those could match up with, you have, to, you have to rotate these and look to see how they would fit together. All right? And if you can rotate them and look to see how the, they fit together and figure out that it's this one, um, essentially what you're doing is you're, you're practicing mental rotation. What you're doing is you're practicing the process of uh, identifying um, uh, distinct smaller, uh, smaller grain spatial representations and then combining them into a more coherent whole. All right? Now children who receive mental rotation training of this sort, um, even at the ages of six to eight, uh, perform, subsequently perform better on uh, multi-digit calculations and um, a missing term problems. So this is like a missing term problem. All right. Now again, it's, it's kind of an opaque relationship because it doesn't seem on the surface like doing something like this should help you with these other simple mathematics tasks. But um, you know, and, and I, what I think is, is happening is that whatever transfer is going on is occurring at kind of a deeper cognitive level. It's not necessarily that you are using spatial relationships to solve this problem. It's something more like um, you're getting better at um, uh, identifying individual elements in a spatial orientation um, and then combining them into a coherent whole. So it doesn't have to come in the context of a spatial problem. It can come in the context of a mathematical problem. All right? I, I have a question. Yes. Um, in this particular task, it was just 2D. It was this particular task. Um, 3D tasks tend to be very hard for young children. So much of the training that I think people have focused on with young children, at least, has mostly involved two-dimensional two mental rotation. But yeah, you could, you could implement training in that way. Um, and I, I have a, 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 my guess is that you would probably yield um, similar effects. Um, you know, a, a lot of times, things that we do in experiments don't necessarily reflect exactly what you would want to do in the real world, but that's just a function of our need to be able to really, really, really prove that it worked, if that makes sense. Um, yes? 
So her question was, uh, is there, it seems like you're identifying a uh, kind of a, a trend in children's activities toward, um, you know, not manipulating physical objects as much and uh, uh, really kind of, in, if they engage in similar tasks, they do so in something more like a virtual environment, right? Um, on a computer screen or something like that. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna say there are people studying that. Um, and, and I think this is gonna help answer your question right here. Um, uh, one thing that's been found in the research literature is that using concrete objects does help people learn to form these coherent holes from uh, simpler spatial representations. Um, and one of the big ones that I mentioned earlier is just base 10 blocks, all right? Um, uh, there's some, some, some research out of our lab that, that showed that uh, the use of base 10 blocks improved learning of place value concepts, and, and it was particularly true for struggling students. Um, sometimes children who are a little bit more advanced in mathematics, um, this can impede them a little bit if they're really good at working with symbols. But kids who aren't particularly great at working with symbols, which is really one of the core issues in, in people who have mathematics difficulties, oftentimes it's the symbol processing that's the very, very difficult part, the mapping of symbols to, to quantities. Um, for, for children who struggle more with mathematics, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that um, these concrete objects uh, uh, help people um, uh, uh, improve their, their um, uh, mathematics abilities. In these, this is in a relatively narrow way, but we think this might generalize more broadly. Um, now, uh, this is one thing I want to talk about next. A follow-up in this same study was the success of children in Montessori schools, which tend to use a ton of concrete representations, stuff like this, all right? Like this is a concrete representation of place value. I hope everybody can see that right there. But you have a number, and then that number below it, are there are seven one thousands to show that there are seven one thousands. And then there are six one hundreds, and then there's one ten, and then there's five ones, all right? Um, so this is exactly the kind of concrete object that does seem to help children um, uh, uh, get better at uh, um, learning mathematics concepts. Now that said, I am not uh, an enemy of technology in any way, um, and I would be willing to bet that with enough careful design, you could probably develop electronic tools that would yield uh, similar results. My guess is they aren't there yet, you know what I mean? Now, like, is doing Minecraft the same thing as block play? I don't really know. I mean, um, yeah, go ahead. Right, right. Um, so, so what you're talking about is it seems like you're, you're suggesting that, um, and, and I, do, I do think that the research on this agrees w with you. There's um, research that shows that kids who have better finger gnosis, it's called, better abilities to, to individually move their fingers tend to be better at math. Um, and a lot of this is probably the product of a long evolutionary process where we started counting on our fingers um, and you know our brains evolved over time to kind of um, map some of the same numerical cognition uh, onto similar regions of the brain as we used to manipulate our fingers. Um, uh, now, so there might be, so, so my guess is that there probably is something about um, uh, sensory motor activity is, is based, that, you're, that, you're, that you're basically describing um, that is a, a really, really big help to learning these concepts. But, um, you know, one thing I'm always loath to do, I, I, I agree with that a lot, but I, I do tend to, I do try to dissuade people from drawing the conclusion, so that even if that does help, um, I do try to dissuade the people from drawing the conclusion that that is necessarily going to be better than everything else. You know what I mean? So, I mean, is it possible that we could develop, a, a, um, you know, um, virtual environments that would yield similar benefits? Sure. I mean, I don't know. We should try. That's my opinion on it. Um, but I, I do agree that, that there is a lot of research that shows that there is something special about that, at least. Um, it may not be the only way to do it, but there is definitely something special, uh, and, and our, our cognitive systems are, are it, it basically designed to take advantage of that kind of interaction with the world. Um, so uh, on, that, on that note, you're, you're really good at predicting all, what my next slide is going to be. I like you. <laughs> um, so uh, and one place that we've seen this is that spatial motor activities help kids get better at magnitude comparison. So if you take little kids, um, now I don't have a good picture. I couldn't find a good picture of this. But um, what they had children do was do a magnitude comparison task, just like the one I saw before, which is bigger, seven or three. Um, and uh, what, they, what one group of children did um, was they um, answered, first they practiced magnitude comparison by stepping one way or the other on a mat. So they'd be in a central place on a, on a mat, um, and if uh, the, the target number was, was bigger than the, um, uh, 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 the prompt, then they would step to the right. 
um, just as you would go right on a number line, right, as the numbers get bigger. If um, uh, the target number was smaller than the stimulus number, they would go left, okay, to show that the number is left, just in line with uh, what you would expect on the number line. And it turned out that that did um, lead these kids to outperform uh, children who simply practiced magnitude comparison on a computer screen. Now, um, could you potentially achieve the same goal if you, instead of just having pick kids, kids pick which number is which, could you possibly achieve a, a similar um, goal by maybe having them physically drag something or by um, having them do some sort of motion with their finger or, or, you know what I mean? I don't want to rule any of those things out is my main point. Um, so, you know, while I think it's important that we recognize uh, where uh, our, how our cognitive systems are designed and where the advantages are um, in, in sensory motor cognition and things like that, I don't want people to draw the conclusion that that's the only way to do it and that we should stop trying to do other ways. Um, so uh, here's a, another one. This is a, a research done by a colleague of mine at the University of Maryland. Um, they've shown that board games such as Suits and Ladders actually help kids uh, develop linear representations of numerical magnitude. One thing that, that, that happens a lot when kids are really young, if you give them a number line task, like the, the one that you saw before, where we had 0 to 100 and where's 37. Um, uh, when kids are really young, they tend to have um, what's mathematically described as a logarithmic representation of magnitude. They tend to think that as numbers get bigger, they get closer together. All right, so um, a, a really common feature of this, as you'll see, is, is a, a kid who has a logarithmic representation, will, um, uh, the number 50 won't be in the middle, all right? Um, it'll be off to the side uh, uh, because they don't, they don't view numerical magnitudes in, in terms of a linear function. Now, but that's a really, really critical part of mathematics learning is recognizing that the differences between um, uh, 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 items, uh, excuse me, the differences between units are the same for every pair of units, no matter how big the numbers are. Um, and, and just playing a game like this, like shoots and ladders, you know, so you roll a dice and then you, you go a set number of units, right, where each of them are the same amount, right? And that's just the key part of this. They start to come to recognize that when you count up one, it's the same distance every single time, no matter how big the numbers get, all right? And, and that's something that, the, so, so this game can help people get to that linear representation uh, of, of uh, quantity a little bit sooner. All right, so I'm on to my last part here, which is good, because I only have about five minutes left, but uh, I did want to talk briefly about um, how the arts, how I think the arts can help. Now, again, I'll preface this by saying, there's not any empirical research on this. So this is essentially me conjecturing about how I think we might be able to take advantage of some of the, the spatial effects on mathematics learning um, and uh, so forth that uh, uh, in, in tr through the use of um, artistic instruction. I think one of the biggest benefits of using the arts for instruction is the increased engagement that kids get out of it. I think that um, that alone in a lot of cases is, is worth uh, uh, um, uh, a lot in terms of student learning. Uh, there's a, I, I went to a talk recently by a very um, uh, well-known mathematics researcher who's moved into classroom research, and, uh, and, and he's, he likes to say that the single most precious um, uh, uh, substance or um, uh, 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 object there is in any classroom, this, the, the most precious thing there is is engagement, right? Um, if a student is not engaged, if they're not looking you in the eye, if they're not engaged in the, in the activity, they don't learn. And it's hard to keep kids engaged, um, especially with something like math. Um, uh, I think that math could be more engaging if we didn't make a habit of saying it's boring. Um, that's one of my, obviously one of my pet peeves. But a lot, there are a lot of kids who grow up with people telling them every day, math is boring, math is hard, math is boring, math is hard. So they come in with that expectation. And if they have that preconception, then I think something like the arts can, might be able to shake that. My preference would be that they never got that conception in the first place, but that's a much harder battle. Um, so I think that a lot of activities in the visual arts, like drawing, engage students in mental rotation practice. I'm just going to show you a picture here. I don't know if you guys have any art teachers here. I don't know if you've ever done any studies, uh, like, like uh, 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 drawing studies like this, where you take a, sim a single object, and then you try to draw it rotated at regular angles in, in just this sort of a way. In order to do this, you really have to think hard about how that object rotates in space. And you have to think hard about where the different um, features in the picture are, how they relate to one another spatially, and how they come together to form that coherent whole that's a bear. All right. 
Um, so I think stuff like this would be, you know, would probably yield effects very similar to, you know, uh, the abstract examples that I gave before, where you have people like, you know, redrawing rotated block shapes or practicing rotating letter-like figures. I don't see any reason why this wouldn't yield the same benefits. I'll caveat that by saying nobody's tested it. So, um, you know, like I said, that's the gold standard for research, and I fully endorse that. I want somebody to test this, though, because I think it'll work. Um, I think the arts can also be used to create the very concrete objects that we already know help with some of these uh, mathematics um, uh, topics. Um, I don't know if you've seen this before. We saw the base 10 blocks before. These are homemade base 10 blocks. Um, kids took beans, they glued them on a popsicle stick, all right? Just as good as a base 10 block, but you've, now you've made it a piece of art. You didn't make it this cold, sterile, blue block thing that you know just brings out dread when you see the teacher bring the giant bag of them out from the bin, all right? Um, you know, I think that, that having children build their own manipulatives uh, and, and build their own um, uh, uh, concrete representations of mathematics would be a really way to make that kind of activity much more engaging. It might take a little bit of extra time, but my guess is it's probably worth it. Um, and in the context of something like arts integration, if you can, you know, sort of um, pool your time, so to speak, in arts and mathematics, so that some of the stuff that you're doing in mathematics helps with the arts, and some of the stuff you're doing in the arts helps with mathematics, um, then you may be able to do this with just a minimal loss of, of instructional time. Um, I think that that is that's one of my core. Honestly, my core criticism sometimes about arts integration is that people pretend that it doesn't take any more time than regular instruction when it does. It just does. I've never seen anybody come up with an arts integrated lesson on a single topic that took exactly the same amount of time as a, a conventional one. It's almost impossible to do because you're doing a lot more and it's just simple, you know, it's just um, simple time physics at that point. Um, okay. One more, um, uh, one more example that I want to give, and then I'm going to open it up for questions, is I think that you could also practice mental rotation through dance. Um, so this is an idea I had that I was thinking about the other day. So you know, if you have a, a, a ballet dancer, or it doesn't have to be a ballet dancer, it could be anything, or it could just be a, a physical pose of some sort, and you have one kid do it, and then you say, OK, hey, uh, that's good. I, I like that kid is making that pose like that. Hey, you, uh, other kid, um, can you try to put yourself in the same position except rotated 180 degrees? Um, you know, I think that in order to do that, that, that kid is going to have to sit there, look at their peer, think about what would that peer look like if they rotated 180 degrees, and then try to use their own body to put themselves in that position. Um, I, think it's a, I think this is a pretty good example because it, it definitely requires mental rotation, and then it also builds in some of this kinesthetic or, or um, uh, uh, sensory motor activity that, that you know, as, as we've been talking about earlier, um, uh, uh, we sort of already know is, is useful for mathematics learning, all right? So um, these are just a few uh, possible activities. I think there are tons of them out there, and I, I want people to think of them more. One of my problems is I'm not a classroom educator. I'm not an arts educator. I have some experience studying arts and cognition. I have some experience um, uh, in uh, evaluating arts integrated curricula. But it's not like I came through my schooling like practicing coming up with arts activities that integrated academic content. I think teachers are probably much better at it than I am. And I just want them to do it more. That's really it. I just want them to try to do it more. Um, and you know, it's hard. I'm sure it takes practice. But I think the payoff is there. So I'm just going to run through a few conclusions. Um, the first one is I, I just want you to, to try and internalize what I think the, the, um, uh, the core link between mathematics abilities and spatial abilities is. And I, I think that um, what we need to recognize is that they are separate domains, but they have a lot in common. And, and foremost uh, among what they have in common is that in order to perform well and to effectively use a holistic strategy to solve the problems, um, Kids have to be able to, people in general have to be able to construct coherent holes out of multiple spatial representations. You have to have different things in different places in space, and you have to combine them into one whole. You know, whether that's in a visual array, whether that's in figuring out what a, a, a figure looks like under rotation, or whether it's recognizing what the magnitude of the fraction 3 ninths is. You're still doing some of the same things at, at root. You're considering things that lie in a spatial relationship to one another, that have meanings and interpretations individually on their own. But in order to make it work, in order to tr understand what the intent of that representation is, you have to be able to combine it into a coherent whole. 
All right, use of concrete representations like we've just been describing can make spatial relationships easier to see and they can help with um, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, especially when the content being taught is new, all right? Um, you know, at the same time, we've, like, like it was mentioned earlier, kids who count on their fingers um, you know, may do better, but I'll tell you what, if a kid's still counting on their fingers at seven or eight, that's a sign of a real problem. All right, now that doesn't mean that you should necessarily discourage them from doing it. It just means that you need to intervene because if, you know, over time as content is mastered, you have to be able to back away from these concrete representations and represent them mentally in an abstract form. Um, so, you know, I, uh, you know like uh, one of my um, most, uh, uh, I, I really don't like it when teachers oftentimes, and you get a lot of pushback from kids and parents. It's like, well, why do I have to do it this way? Instead of, you know, why do I have to do it this way? I can just use my fingers. It's, it's not that you're gonna get it wrong if you use your fingers. It's just that you're not engaging in the kind of mental practice that's gonna be required when you move on to any sort of more complex mathematics. So I don't think that finger counting is bad. I don't ever really think it should be discouraged, but um, you know, it, it certainly is not a solution for all, you know, for, for, for a, a long-term trajectory of mathematical growth. Um, Last thing I wanna talk about, spatial training. The only place where training has really been uh, tested is in mental rotation. Nobody's really tried to train sp visual spatial working memory. Nobody's really ever tried to train block design or something like that. Um, I think people should try to do that too. Like I said, the main reason that people target mental rotation is it already has a, a, a known strong relationship to mathematics ability, which when we're just trying to sort all this stuff out, like I said, we're in the infancy of this uh, um, line of research, uh, you gotta target where you think the big effects are, otherwise you're gonna be blowing a lot of grant money. Um, uh, not to get crass about it, but that's just truly the way it is. Um, uh, I think that many artistic activities uh, naturally lend themselves to these goals, both the use of concrete representations and to the kind of training um, particularly related to mental rotation uh, uh, that could improve mathematics abilities. Um, and then, like I said before, I think teachers always need more ideas. If you have ideas, if parents have ideas, if anybody has ideas, we just need to share these ideas and try and build on them over time um, because we are trying to do something new here. Um, I think it's very important to get away from uh, uh, sort of dogmatic pedagogy or anything where instruction is guided by you know, a rigid philosophy. And we need to try things out and see if they work. We need to do that a lot more than we're doing, in my opinion, in educational um, settings. I think some of that is, is a product of the standards movement, although I don't have a huge problem with a lot of the standards movement. Um, uh, uh, you know, if you just had standards and then allowed teachers to teach things in whatever ways worked for them or to develop their own ideas, I think that would be ideal. But instead what you end up with are um, situations where standards have a bad name because teachers feel that those standards bind them to teach in a particular method, otherwise they're gonna get in trouble, all right? Um, so yeah, like I said, I don't think standards are bad at all. I think it's a matter of implementation um, and in uh, uh, giving educators the, the, the freedom to try, to, to try new things and, and see if they work to try to help achieve the same educational goals, all right? So that's it, I'm, I'm done talking, I only went five minutes over. Um, I just wanna acknowledge a couple of people. Uh, a lot of the work here that, um, I discussed the, uh, Dr. Mix's work, some of my own work was, uh, has been conducted in collaboration uh, uh, with others at the Learning and Cognition Lab at the University of Maryland. Uh, we've had funding from the Institute of Education Sciences and the National Science Foundation. They always love to hear things like people like me coming into an educational community and, and recognizing that they're a source of funding that's leading to important educational discoveries. Um, uh, if you wanna contact me, I'm gonna leave this up here. My email is, that's an L, not an I. I get this mistake a lot. It's lrinne, L-R-I-N-N-E, at umd.edu. Um, if you email me, I'm, I'm, I'm always glad to answer specific questions or point you toward um, uh, references or information on a particular topic, or um, if you want references uh, related to something that you heard tonight, um, or, or one of the things that I cited in the presentation, I'll be glad to send you a reference list, or um, in a lot of cases, I can just send you the paper itself. Um, I know that it's terrible, but uh, it's hard to get a, a, a lot of journal articles these days because um, they don't make money when we just freely distribute them, which means they're all behind university library paywalls in a lot of cases. But um, if people contact me individually, it's perfectly fine for me to give them uh, to you. I just can't distribute them en masse without a publisher coming after me. Um, I wish I could. Uh, and questions, that's the last thing.
Yes, sir. The question there was, um, you know, if somebody has a limitation in visual spatial processing, should you try to improve their visual spatial processing, or should you try to look for some alternative means of instruction well, in order? Are there alternative means? Yeah, I mean, this spatial thing is just one way. That's why I want to emphasize this, is that, you know, there is a link between spatial ability and mathematics, but there's a link between mathematics and executive function. There's a link between mathematics and count, just basic counting ability. There are links between mathematics and lots of other cognitive domains, and we don't really know yet. I'm, you know, the, the short answer, I can't tell you anything great other than we're working on it, honestly. Um, uh, you know, we're learning the things that, like I just mentioned, executive function. We're learning more and more about how um, helping children develop better executive function skills um, might help them overall. But at the same time, uh, we also encourage teachers to use uh, compensation strategies at times. Um, where, you know, if you know that a kid struggles with executive function, just like if you knew that they struggled with visual spatial ability, you might want to do both simultaneously. You might want to try to improve their visual spatial ability uh, or their executive function ability if a kid, for a kid that has a, a, a different kind of um, issue. Um, at the same time, as you look for uh, alternative means to try to, uh, uh, you know, inculcate those kids with that, that good math content you want them to get. Um, now, in, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, there are, there is some linkage. I am aware that there is uh, a linkage between mathematics learning disabilities and in some, some kids uh, do seem to exhibit uh, uh, difficulties with visual spatial processing. Um, but one of the difficult things about learning about math di disabilities is that um, they're much more multifaceted than say reading disabilities. Um, you know, I mean, people with math learning disabilities can exhibit um, normal performance on some measures and, and um, very low performance on other measures or vice versa. Both of them can be math learning, dis have, be diagnosed with a math learning disability. Um, you know, now, uh, uh, in general, I, I tend to shy away from the idea that you're going to sort of overly differentiate. One of the problems with, you know, one of the directions I don't want people to, to, to take some of this research is that, um, you know, even if a kid has a, a deficit in visual spatial processing, um, it's not like it's necessarily the case that improving their visual spatial processing won't improve their mathematics skills. It might help, but you should also think about doing other things too. Um, I mean, this is a terribly unsatisfying complex answer uh, that uh, is, I've got to say, is really just largely the function that we're, we're sorting these things out in the last 10 years. We haven't had the 50 years of research that people in reading have had. Um, and there are some things that inherently make math, uh, math learning disabilities just more difficult to study. They're more multifaceted. They involve a wider variety of cognitive functions. Unlike reading, math topics um, compound on themselves over and over as you get older and older in age. You know what I mean? Like, um, so you get new, there's so many different kinds of topics. There's only so many different kinds of reading. You know what I mean? But there's multitudes of different kinds of mathematics, right? Um, so figuring out what a math learning disability is, uh, figuring out what's causing it and figuring out how to compensate for it is a really, really complicated question that uh, unfortunately doesn't have any simple answers. And, and that's one of the reasons that I, I, uh, my um, main encouragement for people is to um, try things out based on what you might be able to learn from scientific research and see how they work and not get stuck in some kind of dogma. And if it doesn't work, switch. All right. Uh, so I'll, let me. So, so the question there was, uh, you know, we have some of these core cognitive capacities that we know are linked to reading disabilities. It sounds like are there some similar set of underlying cognitive capacities that are uh, uh, linked to mathematics learning disabilities? And um, the uh, answer is a big yes, but. Um, there are a lot more of them. That's kind of the problem, and they aren't nearly as consistent. Um, honestly, we are still at the stage, and if you talk to a school psychologist, the primary way that people diagnose somebody with a math learning disability is uh, persistent performance below the 10th percentile over a, over a period of several years. Um, so there isn't the same kind, you know what I mean? You can't give someone a, 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 a set of cognitive tests and, and have that automatically tell you one way or the other whether a child has math learning disabilities. Uh, a, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Daniel Ansari, has published a study that argues that there are actually seven different subtypes of math learning disabilities. Um, some people have 
uh, problems that derive primarily from executive functioning. Some people have problems that derive primarily from um, just uh, uh, poor numerical processing. Some people can't use symbols. Some, you know what I mean? Um, so we're, we're in the process of learning what the underlying capacities that are required for mathematics are and what capacities might be most likely to be impaired among students who have a math learning disability. But um, the, the, uh, the big but is uh, there's so much more variability in students with respect to each of these different capacities and just the process of doing and learning mathematics in general requires a wider range of cognitive capacities uh, uh, than, than reading does. So um, there are people who argue that mathematics learning disabilities is primarily a deficit of executive function. There are people who argue that math learning disabilities are primarily a function of this thing called the approximate number system, um, which is essentially a, an individual's ability to uh, 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 recognize um, how big uh, collections of objects are and map them to numbers. Um, there are some people who think that it's a combination. Um, so uh, there are some, and, and all of these are core deficits that are correlated with the, the prevalence of mathematics learning disability, but um, none of them by itself seems to do the job of capturing the range of phenomena that we see in students who have math learning disabilities. So instead of, what I would say is for the time being at least, we're really stuck using a criterion kind of diagnosis if we want to keep this as a single class of individuals. But at the same time, if someone is really struggling with math and you find that that particular individual um, is, is also struggling with um, one of these particular uh, uh, underlying cognitive capacities that we know is correlated, even if it's not a, a die-hard diagnosis, um, it gives you a clue. Um, and, and that clue is somewhere to start. Uh, and so I don't, I don't want to be too pessimistic about it. We're in a much better place than we were 15, 20 years ago. As far, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of people wouldn't, you would have said math learning disability and they would have said, what? Um, I don't even know what that is. I've never heard of that. Uh, so another terribly unsatisfying answer to a very good question. Uh, I, I hope that, that helps a little bit at least. Yes, ma'am. Are there different cognitive profiles, so to speak, um, that might lead people to be, um, uh, you know, have a, a, a learning disability in one domain like reading, but then somehow that profile also makes them better at uh, a, another um, uh, a subject matter, uh, area of subject matter like mathematics? Um, I'm generally skeptical of that hypothesis. Um, I, my guess is, you know, look, look, we're all, all of us have varied aptitudes, all right? You know, we all have varied aptitudes. I am not very good at drawing. I'm terrible at drawing. Um, I'm very good at math, um, you know what I mean? Now, do I think that my ability to do math and it, it is causally related to my inability to draw in some way or vice versa? I don't see any reason for thinking that. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's certainly possible, but I have not seen any evidence that has convinced me that that's a plausible hypothesis. Now, at the same time, there are definitely kids who are completely unimpaired in one domain while being impaired in, uh, uh, in another domain. Um, you know, one of the, the, classical, the classical original form of dyscalculia that uh, people talked about in the literature starting in the 90s was something that was thought to be just a pure deficit in number processing. Like you just couldn't, like the way that I describe it is, is you know, a, a kid would see the number seven um, and, you know, versus the number four. And for us, if you see a collection of objects or the number uh, seven objects or the number seven versus a collection of four objects or the number four, one of them just kind of screams at you seven and the other one screams at you four, you know. Now, um, for a kid with a math learning disability or a core uh, deficit in numerical processing, they just don't scream as loud um, and they sound alike. That's kind of the best analogy that I can give for what people um, origin. Now, but we found out that that's only a small part of the story. Um, there's all kinds of things like executive functions, like some visual spatial abilities that are unrelated to number processing 
um, you know, uh, uh, and any of a, a variety of, of others. Working memory is a very um, uh, is very very strongly related with math learning disabilities. Um, I generally group that under the heading of executive functions. Oftentimes, we, we kind of in research we kind of think of that as all being under the same umbrella. But I realize that it's it's different um, in the way people talk about it. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, I'm skeptical of that hypothesis. But um, uh, it, it, like I said, it. It doesn't necessarily mean that if a child has a deficit in one domain, um, my guess is that if they do seem to be very, very good in a different domain, my tendency in the absence of evidence to the contrary would just be to you know, draw the conclusion that this kid has a learning disability in one domain and they just have a good aptitude in this other domain. And that's just kind of the way it went. You know what I mean? That's kind of the way it goes for all of us. Uh, so it, you know, it, that would be my explanation of such a phenomenon um, if I encountered it uh, right now. Um, so hopefully that, that helps your question. Um, one more thing that I, I, I will mention that, that I think will be valuable to, to some people and, and does follow from that point is that there is a relatively large degree of comorbidity between reading disabilities and mathematics learning disabilities. Um, uh, and th that's a very, that's an area of research that we are just figuring out um, now. Last five years, honestly, is, is where that area of research has really started to blow up. Um, you know, and we find that a child who has a reading disability alone versus a child who has a math disability alone versus a child who has both reading and math disabilities all have very, very different um, uh, sort of uh, uh, ability levels when it comes to cognitive performance on the, some of these uh, uh, measures of underlying cognitive ability. Um, there's there's a, a definitely a relation between reading fluency, um, the rate at which a child can read, um, and uh, for instance, what is this some research that I've worked on? Uh, children who have poor reading fluency have a very, very hard time learning their multiplication tables because they can't repeat the math facts to themselves very quickly. Um, especially when they're studying them on paper. Um, and if you can't learn math, math, uh, multiplication facts, you have a really hard time with algebra. I mean, th th you know, so that's, that's one route. Um, there are uh, you know, also people who, you know, if they have a, a reading disability, um, struggle with phonological processing or uh, rapid automatized naming. Rapid automatized naming has also been linked to um, math learning disabilities. Um, uh, uh, for, for some of the same reasons that it's linked to reading disabilities. Um, you know, if you can't identify a symbol or an object and name it quickly, it's gonna make it hard to learn, uh, you know what I mean? And, and so, so some of these things may underlie the comorbidity of, of uh, reading disabilities and math disabilities, um, uh, you know, but at the same time, there are some kids who don't have a deficit in, in rapid automatized naming or might not have any, any sort of um, difficulty that, that leads to a, a comorbid relationship and they end up with just sort of a purer form of reading disability or a purer form of math disability. Um, uh, and, and like I said, I, 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 I can't give you any strong conclusions on that because this is something that we're currently sorting out um, in the research literature. But you know, I, I, think it, I think the main thing that I would, I would suggest people conclude from this area of research and, and, or you know, if somebody has a deficit in spatial ability, nobody's really looked at whether deficits in, in most of these spatial abilities are linked to um, math learning disabilities. Um, you know, I mean, just because we're really just now learning about the relationship between spatial ability and mathematics ability in general, you know, let alone in, in a population that struggles in one of those domains or the other. Um, but uh, when it comes to math, math learning disabilities, the, the main lesson that I, would, that, I would, that I would suggest to people, or the main thing if you want to think about it, is it is not a unified thing. It differs a lot from kid to kid. It's hard to diagnose. Um, and it can take a long time to sort out uh, uh, what um, exactly a, a child's particular set of underlying difficulties might be. Um, but uh, you know, if you're armed with some knowledge of the kinds of deficits that are associated with mathematics learning disability, you get, you get some clues and you try things out um, and hopefully you find something that works. And in a lot of cases, people do find things that work. Um, so uh, you know, I don't wanna make it seem like it's irremediable or like we have no idea what's going on. It's just that it's not as clear cut as it is with reading disabilities, at least at this stage. Hopefully in 20 or 30 years it will be. I mean, I know that's very unsatisfying for people who have children now. <laughs> um, but unfortunately that is the length of the arc of uh, you know, scientific research in, in cognitive studies and psychology. It, it happens on the order of decades, not the order of years. Um, so uh, you know, uh, it, the, the cure-all is, 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 not, is not close, but 
um, that doesn't mean that, that people should uh, stop trying to look for um, alternative routes to teach mathematics for children who seem to be struggling with whatever route is being traversed right now. Um, there's no reason to keep doing the same thing that's not working. That's for sure. Um, so, are there uh, any more questions? Yes, sir. I'm going to be terribly blunt here and claim that there is a poison in our American population that says to kids, it's okay for you to not be good at math. Um, it's a poison. <laughs> I have no other word for it. Uh, it, it you know, um, uh, or you'll hear parents say, I was never good at math either. All right. Um, uh, you know, and, and they use it as an excuse for their child. Now, you don't hear, have you ever heard an adult say, I'm not a very good reader? No, you don't hear adults say that, which is why kids don't say that. Um, now, uh, 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 you know, um, a, a, a corollary of this is that I've sometimes got a question that's uh, of the form, um, why are children from Asia so much better at math? And they want to leap immediately to the conclusion that it's something about their genetic makeup or, or how they're taught in school. And I don't believe that at all. I think that it's because there, it's not okay in Chinese culture, for instance, to not be good at math. Nobody would, if you, if you weren't good at math, you wouldn't want to admit it. You wouldn't, people, when, so when, you get a, people, when people get checks, they're like, I'm terrible at math, you know what I mean? They almost wear it as a badge. Um, so, you know, when, you, you're, if, if insofar as you're talking about um, uh, sort of the self-confidence of the child or the, the child's representation of their own abilities, I think that that is something that comes largely from uh, social factors. Like one topic that uh, uh, is, is coming up a lot lately is, you know, we, we've learned that, I mean, it's almost a little bit scary, but children's ability in preschool to recognize digits, to ident simple digit identification in preschool is enormously predictive of later success in mathematics. Um, you know, now, uh, one of my the things that I say on this is, uh, if you go into, I have a two-year-old. I went into his preschool classroom, and there was an alphabet on the wall. There was, an, there was no one through nine on the wall. Um, and I went to the teacher, and I asked them, can I put one through nine on your wall? Not for my kid, because me and my wife just murder him with numbers all day long. Um, so I'm not worried about ex exposure is not going to be his problem if he has problems with math. Um, uh, but um, there's hesitance to it because it's not something that's, they, they view it, you know, the response I get is it's like, well, we don't want to overemphasize academics at this early preschool age where we should be more focused on play, you know, or we should be more focused on kids learning to share and things like that. And, you know, my, uh, uh, and boy, I hope they don't watch this video. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Uh, um, you know, and, and, but my response is, is that it's, it's, you're only viewing math as overly academic. You're not viewing these other things as overly academic. Um, you know, I'm not saying they should be factoring quadratics in kindergarten or something like that, but, you know, um, I, I think that uh, uh, there are huge effects that derive from children's home environments um, that lead them to enter school with a ton of exposure to uh, numbers or next to none. Um, you know, and, and one thing that I see a lot and, and one thing that, that, it, that, that's kind of gotten me to want to put numbers up everywhere is you see a lot of kids, they, they engage in counting, right? Or they count objects or something like that, but it's completely divorced from the symbols. For, in my opinion, way too long. I think they should get the symbols into it earlier, but there's some hesitance sometimes because people see that as being overly academic. I'm not saying, you don't, they don't have to add. I even sometimes tell teachers, I'm like, you don't have to do anything. Just put them on the wall, and if the kid points to it and says, what's that, tell them. You know? That's all. Like, just, just, it's just pure exposure. Um, you know? But there's something different about the way people view math that I think prevents us from, from making progress or even understanding what a normative trajectory of skill development in early mathematics from, say, preschool through age um, eight or nine would look like. Um, it's hard to tell when kids are ahead and behind. Sometimes kids uh, who appear behind earlier catch up. Sometimes kids don't have any trouble until they have to learn multiplication tables. Some kids don't have any trouble until they have to learn fractions. Um, you know, so we just don't know what that normative trajectory looks like. Um, and I think that figuring that out is compounded greatly 
by the high degree of variability that we see in children's home environments with respect to their exposure to number and quantitative concepts and quantitative language. Um, and I think that that's much more true than, it, than, than is the case for reading. Um, okay, it uh, looks like we're out of time here, so two, two more questions and then we're gonna cut it. All right, so uh, uh, go ahead. All right, now to the idea that kids should be exposed more uh, that suggests that maybe kids are being expected to do too much too soon, a little bit later in school, you're sort of suggesting, or early to mid-elementary years. Um, uh, I, I think that that's possible. I think that it's possible that kids can get discouraged in that situation, and that might be one of the main problems. Um, we, children especially have this very strange misconception about people who are good at mathematics, is, and, and it's the other phrase that just makes my blood boil is math people. Um, there are no math people. That's not a thing. It's not a thing, okay? Um, you know, so, you know, they expect, they see these other kids who are being more successful with mathematics, and they say, oh, I just don't have it, right? And they don't realize that that kid is good at mathematics, probably because he's interested in it, has been exposed to numbers a lot, and is trying very hard. I mean, people who are, there is nobody, like this, this idea of this natural math genius well, there might be some math geniuses out there. I guarantee you there are none of them in any of your elementary school classrooms, just based on probability alone. You know what I mean? Like that's not, it's not, but that's the way we treat them. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I would hesitate to say we should hold off on or push back aspects of the curriculum. Um, but at the same time, we should probably take a different attitude to uh, helping children who are struggling with that content when they reach it. And saying, you know, oh, if you're not going to, um, you know, I mean, if you're not going to be able to do this, you're going to fail, and you have to do it now. It's like, no, just keep trying, you know. And over time, you'll probably get better at it, you know. Now, does it mean you're going to be a NASA physicist? You know, you, math might not be the thing you're best at, but everybody can do math just the same way. We, we should expect everybody to be able to do math just the same way we expect everybody should be able to read. Um, and that expectation should never go away. And if a kid isn't, you know, I mean, if a kid isn't reading by age eight, right, um, you think that, you know, we say, okay, what can we do to fix this? How can we work harder? We don't look at the reading curriculum and say, oh, the reading curriculum is just too tough, you know? Um, so, you know, I see your point, and I definitely agree that sometimes kids can get pushed too hard and they can get. Um, oftentimes they're in situations that are like that because they've had poor math preparation up to that point. And really what needs to happen is not that they need to work harder on what they're working on right now in third or fourth grade. They need to go back. And they need to try to master the things that their elementary school teacher didn't adequately teach them. Um, you know, uh, uh, but at the same time, I, I think that uh, 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 like a lot of pushback against the Common Core has been, oh, the, the standards are too tough, the standards are too tough. It's like, well, if you want people to get better at mathematics, you, it, that almost entails setting a higher standard than what kids are currently attaining right now. Um, you know, and I understand that it makes people's lives difficult, but math is difficult. It's difficult to learn. Um, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that a, a lot of these, these issues that are commonly attributed to the structure of the curriculum or the pedagogy of teaching, uh, uh, you know, have, have more to do with attitudes and beliefs about mathematics and, um, you know, gender, imp you know, I, I mean, the way that, I mean, females are viewing themselves as being poor at math in second grade. I mean, that's insane. Um, you know, and these are all social phenomena. They're not cognitive phenomena. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's my answer to the question. Last, last question. Yes, ma'am. My response to that would be, I bet now, if that kid goes back in two or three years, that kid is going to be better at algebra oh, yeah. than he thinks he is. And he was. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's part of, you know, it's the process of how it's taught and it's the, 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 the child's impressions of their own abilities in that situation. And, you know, there are some bad math teachers. I'm, I'm just going to say that flat out. I'm not of the, I'm not an, I'm not an educational circle, so I'm not bound to the teacher rule of never say anything bad about a teacher ever. Um, especially at the elementary level, there's, there's a dramatic lack of teacher preparation in mathematics at the elementary level. Um, and, and there are just a lot of kids who aren't getting the preparation that they need. And um, we need to fix that. So, um, all right, with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cut it off here. I think we gotta, Thank gotta go. Thank you.